This is Coogan Cassius for Eiffel TV in association with MTK Global. Las Vegas, huge fight week. Uh, it doesn't really get much bigger than Wilder Fury 2, something that we've looked forward to for the last 14 months then. Uh, yes, a huge fight. I'm totally pumped up for it. I'm as excited for this one as I've been for a fight in quite a while. Uh, you know, it's what we've wanted to see and we're getting it. I mean, in, in, in boxing, it doesn't usually happen like that. I think there was a lot of people that were upset when they were uh, going towards the rematch, then Fury pulled out. They had a deal in place, even though it wasn't signed, and he ended up going and doing his deal. Uh, him and Frank did their deal with uh, ESPN to, to move his fights and to come to the United States, and you're sort of like, oh, the rematch isn't going to happen. But everybody said, yes, it will. They were going to have interim fights. They had to win those interim fights, so there's always uh, the possibility of a loss or something happening in the intervening months. But uh, Tyson Fury won his two fights, a big struggle against uh, Wayleen. Uh, uh, Deontay Wilder won his two fights, a bit of a struggle against Ortiz before the knockout. And uh, here we are with the big one, as expected, uh, Saturday night. There's been some rumours kind of floating about, and Mr. Eddie Hearn put this out uh, on TalkSport not too long ago, that he'd heard something to kind of maybe suggest a bit of unrest in the, in the Fury camp. Dan, I know you're in and around the scene and you hear things. Have you heard anything at all to suggest that Fury's camp hasn't gone according, according to plan? I mean, there's always that rumor, but I'm not in the camp. I'm not going to proclaim that I, that I was in the camp, and you just don't know. Those rumors are out there. Uh, whether they're true or not, who knows? I mean, in, in my own interactions, talking and interviewing Fury, uh, you know, he seems in a good place. Everything seems to be okay. You know, it seems to be healthy, but you don't know. You don't know. I don't know. I don't think Eddie knows. I don't think anybody really knows. Um, the same way we don't know about that situation, what happened in Deontay Wilder's camp, because as we found out after the first fight, he had an injury. He was ill. You know, those are things that they're not going to go out and advertise. So if Tyson Fury had the worst camp in the history of his life, they're not going to go suddenly start telling people that. So, look, it's a big fight. I've yet to cover a big fight where there's not some sort of rumor about something or gamesmanship. That's just the nature of the business. Um, hello. Sorry, Dean. How are you? All right. Um, Tyson Fury is very boldly, uh, boldly put out that he'll knock Deontay Wilder out in two rounds. The eye roll suggests that just a little bit of mind games for Mr. Fury then? I don't know exactly what his strategy is going to be, but I look at it sort of two ways. One, I don't really know too many fighters in big fights that I have covered where they actually purposely go out and give their game plan away before the fight, number one. So that would seem to make it look like he's just sort of trying to you know, give us the business and sort of misdirect us a little bit. Um, if he is, in fact, going to do what he said, which is to go right at him, be more aggressive, try to back Wilder up, try to get an early knockout, uh, it might work, and he might have some success briefly, but I don't know if he's going to be able to finish the job, and if he doesn't, it might be like a suicidal move. So my opinion going into the fight is that he's probably not being totally truthful in that that's going to be his actual strategy in the fight. I, I frankly think it would be a, a misguided strategy, but again, that's, that's my, my opinion. Him and his trainer, uh, uh, Sugar Hill, might have a different viewpoint. Does the winner of this fight on Saturday lay claim to being the number one on the planet at heavyweight? I think the most definitely, absolutely. Uh, the winner will still be undefeated. Uh, if it's Wilder, he'll have beaten Fury. He'll have had his you know, 11th consecutive title defense against some other quality opponents, uh, you know, some not so great opponents, but some other good opponents also, whether it's two wins against Luis Ortiz or, you know, even a much more impressive knockout against, say, like a guy like Brazil than Joshua had, whatever. Point is, he'll be the undefeated uh, WBC champion, the undefeated lineal champion, and he'll be champion for since 2015, you know, and made 11 defenses, breaking the tie on the all-time consecutive defense list with Muhammad Ali, his idol, at 10. Uh, so he would definitely have the claim to number one if it's Tyson Fury. He'll have beaten the undefeated guy that held the belt since 2015 and was in an 11th defense, and a guy that a lot of people thought he beat the first time, and that would validate that situation from what happened 14 months ago. And he would still be undefeated also and have, you know, maybe not the caliber of win or the number of big wins as some of the other guys, but he'll have beaten Klitschko. He'll have beaten Wilder. Uh, those are two pretty, pretty big wins. Uh, and, uh, and, and Joshua, because he had took the loss by the way he did against Ruiz in the knockout, uh, even though he won the rematch, 
you're still going to have to say he's not not number one. He'd probably be number two. Depending how the fight goes, in my mind, I would say the winner of Saturday is one, Joshua is two, and the loser of Saturday is probably three. But I reserve the right to change my mind depending on how Saturday's fight goes. So you don't believe that the winner of this fight needs to fight Joshua to then be the number one, so to speak? No, I mean, the winner of the fight doesn't have to fight Joshua to be number one, but the winner of the fight has to fight Joshua uh, to be the number one heavyweight of the era, let's say, or to be the undisputed champion to collect the other belts, and to have the 100% the acceptance by the public that they are number one. Because there will be some people that, whatever happens on Saturday, are still going to think that Joshua is number one, which is fine. I can understand those arguments. You know, he revenged the loss and he's, you know, won all of his other fights and looked good doing so, including against, you know, some other quality guys. But, uh, you know, number one is at this moment in time. So following Saturday's fight, the winner of the fight at this moment in time will be number one. Then, of course, the drumbeat will be once again for that winner to eventually face Joshua. But the, the, the thing that people don't really want to talk about a whole lot is that they got a two fight deal. So the winner of Saturday and the loser of Saturday most likely are going to fight again later in this year, unless the loser opts not to take the exercise, the option that they have for the rematch, which they can do. Uh, so the, the, the loser will have like 30 days or so to let their handlers know and they'll let the other side know that they either plan to uh, exercise the option for the rematch or to pass on it. And, uh, you know, knowing the, the competitive spirit of the two guys and, 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 the, and the kind of money involved in the, in the high level of the fight, they probably would accept the rematch and uh, we'll see a trilogy fight. Joshua and Hearn kind of put out the vibe that they would, depending on who wins the fight this weekend, put out possibly an offer for Joshua to face and kind of maybe bypass that third fight. But which is going to be kind of expected, I suppose, from, from Hearn and Joshua. Look, there's a lot of ways things can go. And we can talk about any number of different scenarios, but everything always changes when the fight's over. So nobody really knows until we see the result of what happens on Saturday. But I certainly think there is, a, there is some scenario where the loser of Saturday's fight decides that they don't want to go through with the third fight and that maybe there would be some kind of conversation between uh, the winner of the fight and, and Joshua. Now, Joshua is fighting Pulev in June. <clears throat> Not necessarily 100% he's going to fight Usyk after that if he wins. So we'll see. I mean, these things have a way of working themselves out. If there's, if there's a, a, a political will on both sides, if the money is there, you know, it, it can happen. But it seems like, at least at the moment, 2020 is the year of Tyson Fury fighting Deontay Wilder twice, the year of Anthony Joshua taking care of two mandatories against credible opponents in Pulev and Usyk. And if he's still standing at the end of 2020 and the guy that comes out of Fury and Wilder is still there, you know, maybe in the early part or the first half, let's say, of 2021, we'll see that big fight. I hope. Where does Dylan White fit into all this? Because there is a little subplot going on with Dylan White, him being the, the mandatory to the winner, which is not going to be called until, obviously, next February, which is a, another year away. So where does he fit into all this? And is there some sympathy from yourself, then, for Dylan White and his situation? I mean, look, Dylan has fought a lot of good fighters. He's, he's won the fights, and, and he's been the mandatory for a while, and he probably should have already had a title shot at this point. You know, he hitched his wagon with the WBC. Uh, they have... Uh, you know, for various circumstances, not necessarily treated him the right way. He had his own issues because of what happened with the, the drug test that then was not a positive drug test, whatever. There were some issues there. Uh, but look, Dillian is a, is a quality heavyweight. He deserves his opportunity. Um, I'm not sure when or how he's going to get it exactly. Obviously, at some point, the BC is going to force the mandatory. But like you said, it's not going to be for a little while. Um, and again, as time goes by, things happen. Dillian is going to fight uh, in the spring against Alexander Povetkin, uh, a fight he should win, but by no means it's a guarantee. So you got to see what happens. I mean, but in the meantime, Dillian White is fashioning a resume uh, with the types of victories that he's had that makes him, without question, the guy out there most worthy of challenging for a heavyweight world title, whether it's against uh, the Wilder Fury winner or a rematch with Joshua, you know, or somebody else that may pick up a belt along the way. Moving away from the, the heavyweight scene, Dan, what, what's your understanding? We're still waiting confirmation of whether Canelo will announce Billy Joe Saunders as his uh, opponent for May the 2nd. Um, could there be another curveball chucked into this? It's, it's Golden Boy, it's Canelo, we never know. I mean, they're trying to get that deal done by all accounts. I've talked to both sides. Uh, the indication to me is that, that they're close, but that Golden Boy, they won't say who. I mean, you can sort of look at the who the other top guys are and maybe sort of figure it out, I guess. But they claim that they have some other names on the list that they that they're still have as possibilities. I suspect that at the end they'll end up getting the Billy Joe Saunders fight done. It's even, I don't know when this video is going to go up, but maybe before it goes up they could have that deal done. I mean, it's, it seems like it's been that close. Um, 
you know, I don't think that if it does get done, I don't really think they want to announce it in the throes of the heavyweight championship because they would. Or do they? Or do they? Well, I, you know, probably not because it will still kind of get lost in the shuffle because uh, even though Canelo and Saunders is a significant fight, it pales compared to this heavyweight championship fight. And at least in this country, Billy Joe is really not a known commodity. Um, but, uh, I, you know, the, the, the smart money, I guess, would say that Saunders ends up getting the fight. Um, Calum Smith, I was told, is definitely out of the equation at this point. I'm not sure who else they're talking to in particular. You know, they, they, I know that they had reached out to the PBC folks about possibly Caleb Plant, who this was before he fought his title defense last week. But, but uh, Plant has said, you know, I'm not going to be rushed. Uh, you know, forget it. We can do it some other time. So he's, he said he's not interested. And he's not in it just for the money. He's, you know, he's making good money right now. So, uh, you know, we'll have to see. But I, I suspect Billy Joe gets the fight. It's just a matter of how much longer it's going to take for them to finalize the deal. Just finally, Dan, just a cutthroat prediction for Saturday. Um, who are you swaying towards? Well, ever since they made the rematch, I, you know, I have not wavered. I, I still think that, uh, that, uh, that Deontay Wilder is going to win by a knockout. As I've said to anybody that has asked me, and it's been a lot of people, I have a lot of respect for everything Tyson Fury has accomplished, what he's overcome, his boxing ability. He's a hell of a fighter. But I, I just don't think that for 12 full rounds he's going to be able to stay away from those massive shots that Deontay Wilder can deliver. Um, if they replayed the first fight 100 times, you know, he probably, Deontay probably ends the fight 99 times in the, in the 12th round. It was just by a miracle that Fury was able to get up and, and survive that one time. That was an anomaly to me. If it happens again, he's not getting up. Stick money on a draw. What's the chances of uh, two draws on the bounce, Dan? You know, <laughs> crazier stuff has happened, is all I can say. You know, it's boxing. Uh, as my, uh, my dear friend and uh, mentor, Larry Merchant, has said many times, boxing is the theater of the unexpected. Absolutely. Dan Raphael, thank you very much for talking to Eiffel TV. Yep, obviously, as I say, enjoy your time here. You're always here anyway, Dan. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to a great night. We know it's going to be eventful and dramatic regardless of what happens. I agree, and I just hope uh, for all the boxing fans that have put their time and energy and, and uh, interest into this fight who are going to spend money for a pay-per-view or buy tickets, and for all of us uh, in the media that have spent a lot of time uh, covering it and writing about it, I hope we all, we all get a great night. Thank you very much, Dan. Cheers, Dan. Okay.